Hi, Marcy. Hey, how are you? Good. How are you doing? I'm doing all right. Good. Let me introduce this. I'm Robert Wright. This is The Wright Show, available on both streaming video on bloggingheads.tv and, uh, and via audio podcast. You're Marcy Wheeler, uh, proprietor of the blog Empty Wheel at emptywheel.net. I noticed that you have some guest contributors there sometimes. Has that been happening all along or is that new? Yeah, it's been happening all along, but we're not a big, you know, it's sort of when their lives permit and when yeah. they've got the extra time to, to, uh, to put stuff up. Yeah, no, I looked at the blog and was briefly under the uh, impression that you were like a serious uh, football fan. But then I realized, <laughs> no, that post hadn't been written by you. <laughs> no, I am a serious football fan, although this is the year that the injuries has fi- have finally gotten me to like turn off of football. But uh, um, Not the we, kneeling, we, it's the injuries with you. It's the injuries. It's seeing these 25-year-olds have their life career devastated in their first game. Yeah. Okay. So um, now what you uh, – another thing you're very conversant in uh, is the whole Russia-Trump thing, as anyone who reads your blog knows, or who follows you uh, on Twitter at, right. uh, under the handle Empty Wheel. Um, and I'm really, I'm really excited about this conversation because you – fall in a category that I think doesn't have all that many people in it. What I mean is you know a lot about it and have been following it, A. B, you have not been an hysterical about it. You haven't been screaming collusion and treason for a year now. Mm-hmm. But C, if I understand correctly things you've been saying lately, you do think there's probably something there that there may be further revelations that will be damaging the Trump administration and you may even have a suspicion as what they are. Is that is that a fair interpretation? Yeah. Okay, good. Because I wanna hear uh, uh I wanna I want you to flesh out what your suspicions are because I'm sure they're well founded. Uh but first let's do a little background for people. So there's a number of things going on in this front. Uh Today, as we tape, I think Steve Bannon is going to testify before the uh, the uh, House Intelligence Committee, right? That should be entertaining, if nothing else. Sure. Um, the, the Mueller is trying to get Trump to testify. We can maybe talk about that a little. And then, of course, in the recent past, there was the whole uh, thing about the, uh, the Glenn Simpson testimony being released by Dianne Feinstein. His, test- his testimony for the Senate Judiciary Committee, he's the guy who runs Fusion GPS, which had uh, commissioned what became the Steele dossier featuring reports of a P-tape and all of that stuff. So mm. uh, so there's a lot still going on. Um, and why don't we, before we get to your own suspicions about what there may be there, why don't we review last week just, just quickly, because there was some confusion, I think. I mean... Uh, So Simpson um, testified to the effect that uh, Christopher Steele, the the kind of intelligence guy he had, uh, that Simpson had commissioned to gather all this data about Trump and Russia, um, had been so concerned about what he found that he went to the FBI. Right. And then he uh, got the impression that the FBI, in talking to the FBI, that they had another source. And for a while, the, the report was that the other source was someone inside the Trump administration who was so concerned or something that they went to the FBI. But, but, but I think as it's all sorted out, what actually was their other source was what the Australian diplomat whom Papadopoulos, <laughs> this Trump foreign, campaign foreign policy guy, had had in a drunken uh, soliloquy uh, told about the the Russia and and some email, and then the Australian guy had reported to you know word had gotten back through him to the FBI. Okay, I'm going to stop talking now because I've probably already gotten some something wrong. But what is what what do we know as a result of all of this stuff that happened last week? Well, okay, let me take a step back. Uh, the dossier was commissioned by the Democrats around the same time that they discovered, that they announced publicly that they had been hacked by Russia. They had gone to the FBI and said, hey, will you make a public announcement that Russia just attacked us? And the FBI didn't do that. At about that same time, and we still don't know which came first, 
Christopher Steele, as you said, he's a he's a humid guy. He's a clandestine services guy from from the UK that has done a lot of work with American intelligence in the past. Um, was commissioned to do at first just a couple weeks of work to see whether there was any smoke behind the behind Trump's uh, interest in doing business with these kind of mobbed up Russian companies. And the result of that couple weeks work was the P-tape report. Uh, and that that's often as far as people get in reading the dossier. The P-tape report, in addition to the scandalous, you know, uh, Trump commissioned some prostitutes in Moscow to pee on a bed that Obama had slept in, it supported the case that Russia had compromise on Hillary Clinton and, and was in discussions with Trump about releasing it. The date of that report was June 20, June 20th, June 22nd, something like that. June 20th, 22nd, 2016. Now, subsequently, we have learned that on June 9th, 2016, some Russians, uh, one of whom a business person that Trump had old ties with, went to Trump Tower and offered dirt on Hillary Clinton. And we know that two months before that. Now, now this is the famous meeting with uh, with Jared Kushner, Paul Manafort and uh, Don Jr. Yep. Yeah. And a woman named most focus has been on a woman named Natalia Veselnitskaya, who's a Russian lawyer. And um, so that's sort of what happened is that Steele happened to produce a report that in many ways completely differed from the Trump Tower meeting, but in some ways predicted what was what had already happened in the Trump Tower meeting. The rest of the Steele dossier really hasn't come to, has not been corroborated as much as you hear on TV. And there are reasons to have suspicions about the dossier. One, about how how Steele decided to go to the FBI, about the terms on which he went to the FBI, about how that dossier was used by the FBI, and frankly, about whether Russians learned of the dossier and learned of Chris Steele's project and used it to plant disinformation, both with Hillary and with the FBI. So frankly, I'm somewhat sympathetic to a lot of the complaints that Republicans have about the dossier. But they have since turned that into a question of whether the entire Russian investigation stems from that dossier. OK. And now, what, are, what are their complaints that you are most sympathetic to? Well, I think it is likely that some of the dossier is disinformation planted by Russians. And I think that it is um, that I'm uncomfortable with a political opposition report being used as predicate for things like FISA warrants. Um, it was not exclusively used as such. Any, any step in this investigation would have been backed by multiple sources. I did a piece the other day that showed what we, that the investigation into Trump's people was opened in late July, 2016. So mm -hmm. a month after this, the first report of the dossier, three weeks after Steele first shared, or two weeks after, three weeks after Steele first shared information of the dossier. Um, in addition, there's this George Papadopoulos thing, which you alluded to, which is that um, the, the Trump campaign staffer who was told before the Democrats even know, knew they had been hacked, that the Russians were offering dirt on Hillary Clinton in the form of emails, that staffer, George Papadopoulos, got drunk in London with the ambassador, the Australian ambassador to the UK. And he said, hey, the Russians are offering dirt, right? And that slowly made its way back to the FBI. Mm -hmm. Both of those tips were at the FBI before the investigation was started. So both the Australian tip and the Steele dossier were there before it started. I don't know that we need to say one was more important than the other. We also know that the hack was publicly reported. We know there were other um, tips coming in. So I can point to at least five pieces that went into the predication of the investigation. The, the Republicans are trying to make, make the dossier the sole predication for the investigation. And that serves two purposes for them. One is it, it, it discredits the entire investigation to the extent that they can, you know, fool the press into believing that it is the sole predication. But it also allows them to point to the FBI and suggest that the FBI, this is ridiculous, by the way, to suggest that the FBI was more favorable to Hillary Clinton during last year, during 2000, the 2016 election than to Trump is the height of fancy. But that is what they are now claiming. And I think where we're going with this is that um, 
HIPSI, the House Intelligence Committee, where, as you said, as we speak, Steve Bannon is testifying, is prepping to give Trump a clean bill of health in a couple of weeks. They're they're trying to have interviewed all of the known witnesses and uh, to be able to go out and say in a couple of weeks, uh, we, we've looked at all the evidence, there's nothing there. And really it just stems from politicization at the FBI. And so, uh, so we should end this investigation right away. And at that point, Donald Trump is gonna say, well, then I don't have to interview with Robert Mueller. Mm, mm, okay. that's, where, that's where we're gonna go. Okay. Uh... And their case, the House, the House's dismissal of the whole thing will rest heavily, uh, I gather, on uh, th- casting suspicion on the Steele dossier, which you think in and of itself is not misguided. It's just that you think there's a, there's a lot of other evidence uh, suggesting that, no, it, it would be uh, premature, to say the least, to dismiss this whole thing. So, right. so uh, yeah, you know, the, the dossier, thing- before we – I, 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 I want to get to that meeting in Trump Tower – uh, that we alluded to, because I think that's a lot of where the action is and where you think the action is. Uh, mm-hmm. But as long as we're talking about the dossier, um, could you say a little about your view? This book came out called Collusion by this mm-hmm. Guardian correspondent uh, whose name escapes me. Is it Lucas something? Luke Harden. Luke Harden. And, you know, he was... Uh, I, I haven't read the book, but I heard him on, uh, I think, Terry Gross, and he and he was he talked a little while, and, he, and then he said... Now, if that's not collusion, I don't know what is. And I thought, I'm pretty sure that what you just said does not does not amount to any kind of proof of collusion. Right. And and th- there's really two issues that we should straighten out before we get to that meeting. Uh, one is the term collusion, which, as you pointed out, is really not a legally significant term in this context. Uh, what, what would that mean? What would amount to politically and legally if there was something called collusion? But also, I'm curious as to what you think of the book, because one one other thing I've heard uh, attributed to the author is the view that, well, the Steele dossier, he thinks is somebody said it's 80, it's 80 percent correct. And I thought, well, depending on which 80 percent that is, that may mean it's meaningless. I mean, I mean, but, it's only it. There's no more than 20 percent of it that seems critically important. If all that's wrong, you know, I mean, but, so what is your take on that on that book uh, and and this collusion concept? Well, the book was written closely with folks in the UK who are trying to salvage the dossier. I mean, one of my complaints about the dossier is had Democrats in 2016 or in, in you know, like basically a year ago, almost exactly, had they immediately said after the dossier got leaked, hey, this was our dossier, oppo research, everyone engages in oppo research, we did it, then they would have, they, I mean, they would have avoided much of the subsequent complaint. Um, they still, I think, were idiotic in not uh, not insulating Hillary and the DNC sufficiently from the project. Um, whatever. I'm, we could we could, you know, we could talk forever about own goals on the part of the Democrats. But mm-hmm. I but they the, the Democrats went for basically 10 months trying to avoid admitting that they were behind the dossier. And that ended up getting Steele and Glenn Simpson into kind of a perjury trap because Russians and the Republicans started suing everywhere. And as a result, it came out, it was the Democrats after they had kind of dug in. So now everyone's in the position where they have to dig in and defend the dossier rather than saying, by that point, we had so much evidence in the public record that there was merit to the investigation. And instead, we're still talking about the dossier, which is crazy. So I think the dossier is a series of near misses. So for example, um, it reports on a publicly reported, a contemporaneously publicly reported Carter Page trip to Moscow, which was probably one of the things that led to the predication of the investigation, and says he met with two high-ranking Russians. He did meet with two high-ranking Russians, but not the two high-ranking Russians described in the dossier. And we should say Carter Page is another guy who was a foreign policy campaign aide uh, uh, for Trump. Like Papadopoulos, he's been dismissed as a minor figure, but the truth is it's all relative. I mean, all the people on this team were minor in the scheme of things, but but they were still relatively influential on the team, right? So, right. 
Right. And they were still allowed to make public statements. Um, Page gave a gave a speech that was very critical of sanctions. So, you know, uh, and there's a reason to believe from the Papadopoulos plea that those speeches were a form of signaling to the Russians uh, that 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 this deal was being put into place and that each side was slowly agreeing to a certain deal. Um, but, but wait, what what deal are you talking about? Well, so the well, do you want me to get into the well? I guess this again? is going to get to what your suspicions are. So maybe we'll right. uh, we'll we'll keep people on the edge of their seat for now, um, right. and you can just finish uh, uh, finish my your big thought. release, my, my 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 big reveal at the end your of this, big right? Reveal, now. Yeah. <laughs> um, but in any case. Um, the other thing, so so that again, the dossier I think is a series of near misses on the issues of which Trump advisors were meeting with re- which Russians. But there were a couple of people who were not mentioned that that are key silences. For example, Felix Sater, who uh, is a Trump aide who was dealing with the Russians and and brokering a Trump Tower deal in November of 2015. He's mobbed up. Uh, he has been an FBI informant on two different occasions. He Trump likes to deny ties to him, but he nevertheless has close ties so to was him. Was he an actual Trump aide at some point? He wasn't, but he um, okay. he's more of a broker that Trump has, okay. has. You know, like Trump's business model is relying on money laundering and relying on real estate deals the world around are sleazy. Right. That means that the people Trump does business with are sleazy. And and Sater is one of the people who does his sleaze for him and has done his sleaze in the past. And he's, so. he's what, Russian or Georgian or something? He's- yeah, he's an immigrant, yeah. yeah. I, I think he's a Russian immigrant, but I okay. don't don't quote me on that. Um, so, so he's not mentioned. This guy, Rina Akhmetshin, who Trump would not necessarily have known before the June 9th meeting, but was at the June 9th meeting, former low-level Russian intelligence, um, but working with Glenn Simpson's company on a different project. Mm-hmm. And so one of one of my complaints, one of my two biggest complaints about the dossier are one, um, he, Glenn Simpson was working with the people who met in that Trump Tower meeting and nevertheless didn't get a hint of that Trump Tower meeting. So that like the, the crown jewel of what you would have reported on if you wanted to report on any potential quid pro quo between Trump and the Russians didn't show up in the dossier, even though it was right there under Glenn Simpson's face. Mm-hmm. So that's one complaint. And the other, and, and this is a really serious complaint. The other complaint is that um, Christopher Steele is a follow the money guy. He's not a follow the packets guy. And by that, I mean, he doesn't have particular expertise in cybersecurity. Mm-hmm. And and the dossier is abysmal on cybersecurity. It, it is well behind where I was contemporaneously on reporting of, of the hack and leak and and even further behind where the experts were. So uh, ha- had Hillary taken the steel dossier and used it to determine how to respond to the hack of the DNC and the hack of other Democratic servers, they would have been complacent. They would have been told that the Russians had no intention of using the emails that they had stolen from the servers uh, to, to blackmail her or to, to embarrass her during the election, that instead the Russians were going to release old uh, signals intercepts from when she was visiting Russia as Secretary of State and First Lady. So they would have said, yeah, so what? We got hacked. We don't need to worry about it. That would have been the wrong decision to make. So okay. that's... That's one of my other complaints about the dossier. Okay, so let's let's not take another step toward the big reveal. Uh, <laughs> talking about collusion. First, I want to say I think I misspoke earlier and said that uh, that Fusion GPS had commissioned the Steele dossier. It was commissioned by uh, I guess the Clinton campaign earlier. Actually, it, there had been a commissioning by this conservative uh, billionaire Paul Singer. He had done it through his uh, his right wing media outlet, um, Free Beacon. They mm-hmm. had paid Fusion GPS to start looking into Trump and Russia. I gather back when he was an anti-Trump, Singer was an anti-Trump uh, Republican kind of. But anyway, the commissioning per se was not done by Fusion GPS. Fusion GPS is a gun for hire. You commission them to go get people to compile reports, uh, and and they do it. Um, so. Okay, so the step toward the big reveal is to just, I think, make one more uh, point of kind of clarification about collusion as opposed to other 
things like conspiracy, quid pro quo, and so on. Right. So collusion, uh, you can imagine uh, if if these guys at this meeting said, oh, you're uh, heard, let's suppose that they heard at this meeting or some other way, oh, you've got emails or, oh, you've got some other uh, good oppo research. Um, well, sure, feel free to, to get it out there. Maybe you should call WikiLeaks or something. I mean, I guess I guess that would be collusion, but it wouldn't uh, it wouldn't be say a quid pro quo. Um, I mean, first of all, again, collusion per se is not illegal. I, well, I, I mean, it's some not people might term, say, yeah. but that's a big deal, even though it's totally usual for campaigns to do stuff like this. If you do it with a foreign actor, that's different. Now, you could make that argument, and maybe it is different, but still, uh, that that would be, aside from the foreign actor part, that kind of collusion is a routine part of, of campaigns, right? Getting Taking oppo research and helping it get out there. Which is a point I've made about the dossier. I mean, the dossier itself is foreign research relying on, on Russian spy sources. Right. So what is the distinction between the dossier and the release of Hillary's emails? One, um, the the dossier was compiled using crimes in Russia, right? So paying somebody in Russia to inform on what their government is doing is a crime in Russia, but it's not a crime here. It's spying here. That's okay. that's how we work. Um, stealing emails from a server in D.C. That's is illegal. a crime in this country. Right. So if you are... Um, conspiring with somebody who has stolen emails from a server in D.C., then you are part of a crime here in the United right. States. So if they're um, stolen email. So if you say, hey, maybe you should send the Steele dossier to, Wiki, to uh, WikiLeaks, that's no big deal legally in the U.S. But if you say, hey, maybe you should send those stolen emails stolen from an American server to WikiLeaks, that's a big deal legally in America. Right. And just as an example, we know that Cambridge Analytica, who did a bunch of horrible things in the election. But one of the curious things that they did is very early on reached out to Julian Assange and said, hey, do you need help arranging those emails? Now, it's an interesting question. And and Republic, another one, another kind of obfuscation Republicans and frankly, I think the Russians have done from the start is um, there. There, there is an unknown universe of emails. There are the emails that were released to WikiLeaks in July 20, 2016 that were stolen from the inboxes of DNC, DNC staffers. There are documents released by a figure named Guccifer 2.0 that is presumed to be a Russian front. Um, and those, some of them came from John Podesta. Some of them we don't know where they came from yet. Mm -hmm. um, so, and I, and I, one of the things we're going to learn as we go forward is there are other servers that have been that got hacked, and we're not talking about those servers. Guccifer 2.0 also released some documents from the DCCC, so the um, congressional election arm of the Democratic Party, and those were, by the way, shared such that, uh, especially in Florida, Republicans in Florida could use the information stolen from the DTRIP. Uh, servers to influence their own campaigns. And so there's a guy, Rob DeSantis, who's now running for governor in Florida, but is a, is a member of Congress. And he's been one of these Republicans who's been really active in trying to kind of b rebut the, any, any claims of Russian collusion, if you will. Um, but he was actually helped by these stolen emails. He was mm. one of the races where it was at least a contestable district and this information got released and he had access to it as a result of the theft by, we presume, Russia um, and the release of these emails. So that's something that often gets missed by that is these down, these, uh, down ticket races that were also affected. Um, and so then there are the John Podesta emails that were released in October of 2016. Um, again, that we believe that that came through WikiLeaks. So, so if you're in the Trump campaign and you heard about these emails that were stolen from a server, we've already said if you suggest to the people who stole them or who have them what, how they might publicize them, that's a crime in the U.S. If you just hear about it and fail to report it to law authorities, is that a crime? It's not something Robert Mueller is going to charge. 
right? I mean, he's not going to go after Don Jr. unless he's got something that's going to hold up to... I mean, don't get me wrong. Most of the lawyers uh, involved with people close to Trump are not great lawyers. Like, I, I compare it to the Scooter Libby case. All of the lawyers in that case, every single person who was a subject of the investigation had top top flight lawyers. The lawyers here are not as great. And Robert Mueller has 17 lawyers and all, you know, most of whom are really superb lawyers. Mm -hmm. So that that's sort of an interesting sidelight to this. But um, it's it is it is a question of whether what affirmative actions Trump people took in response to learning that these emails might be out there. So, um, and, and I think, you know, two of the lawyers that, that uh, Mueller has on his team are, are appellate lawyers. Their job, they're not prosecuting anybody right now. They're figuring out what laws are going to hold up if they do try and prosecute somebody. Okay. So they're already trying to understand these questions, I think, and anticipate where they can go. Uh, okay. the, other thing, the other thing that would be prosecutable, and we've already seen that, is money laundering. Right. So Paul Manafort and, and Rick Gates um, got charged in October. And mostly the, that prosecution, I, I think, is, a, is sort of a holding pattern. It is it is um, Mueller warming them up to flip on Trump. Uh -huh. um, they, they, they now have a trial date in May and their charges basically amount to laundering a bunch of money uh that they got for doing Russian policy and not registering it here in the United States. So basically being foreign agents in the lobbying sense, not in the spying sense for Russia and getting paid for it, laundering the proceeds of it um, and not registering for it as you have to do. That's what they're going on trial for in May. But we know that, for example, Manafort had promise to check in with one of these oligarchs and tell him he, he's he's in debt to him for something like 19 million dollars. And he promised to check in with him and let him know what was going on with the campaign on a, on a, you know, on a timely basis. And so that that will come back, this Manafort checking in with this with this oligarch. Um, but for whatever reason, Mueller has not charged that yet. OK, so Manafort, I guess, is one way one segue to that, that meeting at Trump tower um featuring uh jared uh don jr and manafort and these russians nobody who's at that meeting has flipped so no there's nobody who was at that meeting right who's who's testifying for uh, uh telling Mueller the truth right that we that i mean who is who is who who has become uh, who is whatever the term is turned state's evidence or whatever as far as we know, although, so there were four outsiders in that meeting. Um, Natalia Veselnitskaya, who's a Russian lawyer and um, tried to come back to the country recently and didn't get a visa. She, you know, she's viewed as suspect and had been viewed as suspect anyway. So she is unavailable to Mueller's investigators. Mm -hmm. There, There is um, Rina Akhmetshin, who uh, basically is a Russian, uh, he's a Russian born lobbyist. He's the guy I said used to be for a uh, low level Russian intel military intelligence. Um, and he, by the way, is a well accepted figure in D.C. I mean, he's been a source for journalists going back forever. He his kids go to the same school as all the respectable kids, you know. So he's somebody who is well respected or at least well accepted in D.C., um, he was lobbying for uh, the overturn of Magnitsky sanctions. He and this Veselinskaya woman, and that's what they were doing at that meeting. They that's, were at that's that meeting. That's what they wanted. Uh, that's what they would have liked to have happened during a Trump administration is for these sanctions uh, on Russia to be removed. Sanctions under the Magnitsky Act. Um, so that's, and that's the an, quid. What's that? That's, that's that's the that's I guess the quo that they that that was presented in that meeting. If you do X, Y, and Z, um, we expect you to release the And that's something that a lot of oligarchs in Russia would like, and also that Vladimir Putin w would like. I don't know how high it is on his list of priorities. There's also things like Ukraine, um, yeah. where he would not have wanted us to uh, arm, say, to send more arms to Ukraine to fight Russian-backed insurgents and so on. 
Uh, but the sanctions alone would have been fairly high on, on, on Putin's list, right, of things he'd uh, like a Trump administration to, to do? Also Syria. And Syria, and Syria, yeah, Syria, there is evidence that uh, immediately after the election, the Trump people turned towards making an agreement on Syria. Okay. So, so now we're talking about quid pro quos that, that could have possibly uh, happened. In other words... Well, let me jump back uh, to the two other the t uh, two other attendees of the meeting because okay. I think the distinction is important. So those are the, the Veselinskaya and Akhmet Sin were there to lobby for Magnitsky. There were two other people. There was Rob hmm. Goldstone, who is um, rock promoter, a rock promoter for the son of the guy who helped Trump bring Miss Universe to Moscow. So. He is the oligarch who is closest with Trump and who has had long term business discussions with Trump. And he was the key um, go between who set up the meeting, right? He contacted Don Jr. Yeah. And then there's this guy named Ike Kabaladza who works for Aguilara. And he lives in LA and just a day or two before the meeting called up somebody uh, close to Goldstone and said, I, I don't understand why I'm going to this meeting. What's going on? And he was told, we're going to offer dirt on Hillary Clinton. So he got on a plane from L.A. and went to New York and attended the meeting. And the reason I make the, that distinction, you had asked whether anybody from the meeting had flipped. And I, I don't think that's the case. But I, Rob Goldstone had basically, when this all broke, um, fled to Thailand. And he said he was just taking a couple months to you know, get away from it all. But in his statements, he sort of made it clear he's terrified of Russian oligarchs uh, coming down on him. He, he makes it clear that he was uncomfortable at the time doing what he was doing. He, you know, that guy was afraid. And it took like a afraid long... of being killed by the oligarchs? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Um, and he's right, to be, to be because, honest. Because of so... what he knows. And stuff like that happened. So um, yeah. so it took a long time for Mueller to negotiate his return. I mean, he ha he is a dual, I think this is right, a dual UK-US citizen. He has property in New Jersey. So uh, he basically left his property in New Jersey and went to wander around Thailand for months as this was all breaking last year. And it took a long time for Mueller's people to um, kind of encourage him to come back to the country and testify. And he did last fall. And subsequent to that, Mueller has called back at least one person, we believe it's Ahmed Shane, for more testimony and has also showed an interest in a, a conversation that uh, Ivanka had at the elevators with Veselitskaya and Ahmed Shane as they were leaving. Well, we, we think it was Ivanka, right? I mean, the woman says she thinks it was Ivanka, right? The right. Russian woman? Well... Uh, but it, but it also sounds like Ab Machine has is sure confirmed that, and he so, would. And know this would be significant. Why? So they're leaving the meeting, and they run into Ivanka or something. Right. And what I think I think it's significant for this reason. Uh, Veselnitskaya and Ahmed Sheen came into the meeting with Kavaladze. Okay. So okay. they came into the meeting. They were met at the met in the lobby by Goldstone. Brought up. All four of the attendees of the meeting arrived together. If Ivanka ran into just two of them at the elevator as they were leaving, it means the four attendees of the meeting did not leave together. Ah. Uh, and, and, and the two who remained are the ones who have very close ties to Trump going back some time. Uh, and so the scenario is that they were then escorted up to see Trump himself. Or I don't even think that happened. You uh, don't, because that's what Bannon said yeah. in the in the Wolf book. But you don't think that happened. Well, one reason I don't think that happened is later that day, Trump tweeted, uh, Hillary, where are the, your 33,000 deleted emails? Um, and I, I alluded to earlier and didn't finish what I was trying to say is that Republicans have always pointed to the emails Hillary deleted from her server as potentially other emails that were in question. Those emails weren't stolen per se. They were, they could have been hacked by other people, but they were not stolen by the Russian state per se. And so that's a good way to obfuscate things. The fact that Trump tweeted that in the afternoon may be, because what we've learned from the Papadopoulos plea is that there was this signaling back and forth. There was like an April 27th speech that, that Papadopoulos wrote 
that he told a Russian interlocutor of his, this is a signal. This is a signal that we're moving forward on this deal. And so, so, so wait, we, the, the, the speech said what and specifically was a signal of what? It was just I don't know that it was a signal. It was a tweet that said, hey, Hillary, where are the 33,000 emails? Right. No, but I mean, the, the, the Carter Page speech that you seem to know, know was a signal. No, not the Carter Page one. The um, it, it was an it, it was Trump's big first. Oh, um, oh Carter Page speech. said this big Trump speech is a signal. Papadopoulos said it. Oh, Papadopoulos. I'm sorry. I'm yeah. confused. There's so many names floating around. Sorry. But I should yeah. be able to keep the non-Russian one straight. So that's my fault. But um, so so um, so what and what it, what was this Trump speech a signal of? It basically endorsed uh, softening relations with Russia. OK. Explicitly. And and uh, Papadopoulos said to his Russian handler, we'll call him that, uh, this is a signal. This is a signal that we're moving forward on a meeting between Trump and Putin, basically. OK, not necessarily an overture for a, an illegal quid pro quo, just just an overture toward smoother relations. Except that it happened two days after he was told about the emails. Well, that OK, so that, 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 that is suggestive, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, <see. laughs> That's where we get is that that um, the Papadopoulos plea gives you a sense that uh, Papadopoulos, at least, believed there was a signaling back and forth going on. Uh -huh. And there are some some things we know that were signals that part of that happens in advance of that Trump Tower meeting. And of course, when Don Jr. responded to Rob Goldstone about uh, Rob Goldstone about the meeting, he was like, if it's what I think it is. Right. As if he as if he who was kind of tangential to the campaign, as if he already knew about what this dirt was. So, it, you know, I think it's possible. And I don't I mean, I have other reasons that I can't go into for believing that the public story we know about the, the June 9th meeting is just a cover story. But even what I'm laying out, if, in fact, two of the attendees, the ones who pitched the Magnitsky sanctions left and the people who were more trustworthy to Trump people stayed with Paul Manafort and Don Jr. in the room, then it is possible they laid out the quid that if Trump Jr. would commit to uh, relieving sanctions, which was the ask that day, then they then the Russians would uh, commit to releasing these um, these these emails, these these emails with dirt on Hillary Clinton. And we know that six days after that, the first stolen documents were released. Ah, uh, ah, uh, OK. The so, so the two Russians who remained behind were more known to Trump. You Manafort knew them personally, probably, or. Uh, Don Jr. knew them personally quite well. He did. Uh, he knew he knew both of them quite well. Kabbaladze was involved. He was at a Las Vegas meeting in 2013 that celebrated the Miss Universe tournament, uh -huh. Miss Universe pa pageant in Las Vegas. So we know Don Jr. knew them. Okay. Um, and the other interesting thing is that the lawyer representing Kabbaladze in all of this, uh, yeah, just Kabbaladze, I think, it, is a guy by the name of Scott Balber. He works his ultimate client is Aguilarov, the the oligarch in question mm -hmm. but he has in the past worked for trump so he worked to sue to basically a libel case for trump uh in 2013 so the and that lawyer has flown to moscow to try and coordinate stories he keeps you know intervening with the press to kind of get stuff out there preemptively so that lawyer um has been pretty uh, ostentatiously trying to craft the story about this Trump Tower meeting. And he is a guy that Trump would have reason to trust personally because he used to work for him okay, and now so works for us. Say a little more about that. You you said, uh, and I heard you t uh, earlier in some other place, not here, use the term uh, limited hangout. Right. You said you think the meeting was a limited hangout. I, I, I wasn't familiar with the term. Apparently that's like a Watergate term that means it's like a fake story or something well it's a well it's an intelligence term it's not a fake story it is a preemptive partial story okay so, so so the account we've been given of the meeting by whom has been intentionally misleading by pretty much everyone um and remember that one of the things Mueller is looking at is whether 
Trump in single-handedly dictating the first story told about that meeting in July of last year, whether that was obstruction of justice. Right. Trump dictated that story literally after that hour-long meeting that he kind of, uh, he went over in the middle of a dinner and hung out with Putin for an hour without any minders. Right. So Trump on Saturday or whatever day spends an hour chatting up Putin. And then the very next day, Trump overrides uh, other professionals and says, this is what the story of the Trump Tower meeting is. Now, and, that and person, it was a basically a lie, right? I mean, it was a line that the, the he said it was about Russian adoptions. So he was trying which to hide is just that pretty much total bullshit. Well, it's the Russian code for Magnitsky sanctions. Okay. I mean, it, it is. So, so an, unusual, just, an unusual use of the term adoptions. Uh, right. I mean, Putin, in response to the sanctions, uh, prohibited adoptions for, for, uh, of ch Russian children by Americans. And right. So, so it was adoption related. Right. In right. the sense that I'm related to Barack Obama, because after all, we do have a common ancestor somewhere. But... Um, the, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it, it's, I mean, it, what I mean is it could be taken as a, uh, it could be taken as a, in an obstruction of justice case, it's sufficiently misleading to be, uh, uh, to be used in an obstruction of justice case. I mean, there's, if, if, uh, Mueller were to charge that, it, there would be so much else on the table. There would be the firing of Comey and there would be subsequent, you know, uh, firings. And so it would not be just that he wrote that statement, but that statement is one piece of evidence. But I think, frankly, I think the statement is more, it goes more to the core of the matter, which is that uh, if you are trying to hide what happened in that meeting, and when I say limited hangout, I think the story, the first story that got told is it was about Russian adoptions. The second story that got told is the quid was the Magnitsky sanctions and the quo would be dirt on the support by Bill Browder and the Ziff brothers of uh, of Hillary Clinton, basically, the, the financial support rather than dirt. Um, and and Balber went to so Russia. Wait, wait, say, say that again. It, it would be wait. First of all, who told this this version of the quid pro quo story? Who was putting that out? Um, pretty much everyone. Pretty much everyone is saying that that pretty much everyone is saying the only speaker at this meeting was Veselnitskaya. You mean everyone on the Trump side is saying this? Pretty much on every both sides, the Trump side and the Russian side. They're both saying Veselnitskaya went in. She said, we want you to get rid of sanctions. And here, let me tell you what a sleazebag Bill Browder is. And the implication is that the political support that and I don't the Ziff brothers and Bill Browder have given to Democrats. The implication is that would be useful for as political oppo research. We should say Bill Browder is a guy who had been involved with Magnitsky who was who was killed and who's and that's why he's No, no, he's alive. It. He's alive. He's, oh, he's uh, alive. His his some, his somebody was killed. Yeah, Browder, his lawyer or something. Uh Magnitsky, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, uh okay, so anyway, Browder uh is on that side of things and and is very kind of anti-Putin and has yeah. a kind of a connection to Magnitsky. And so they were um uh so so this one fake, well, misleading story is that all they were offering was kind of dirt on Browder, which wouldn't be illegal the way stolen emails would be illegal. Right. Uh, exactly. So that it's a relatively having, innocent yeah. quid pro quo that was the fallback. After it became clear this was about more than adoptions, Trump team and the Russians fell back to this, well, a kind of a quid pro quo that's not illegal. Right. And, right. and that, too, you think is misleading and, and has the benefit of shifting the focus on the dossier because because the Browder stuff that uh -huh. Veselnitskaya was briefing is stuff that Glenn Simpson was working on with Veselnitskaya for a lawsuit against more more oligarchs. There's right. oligarchs I mean, that's, the yeah. As I gathered, that's the irony is that uh, Simpson had previously hired himself out to the other to, yeah. to, to very well, I don't want to get into that, but he is clearly kind of a gun for hire. Uh, right. Fusion GPS. Right. The, um... So that's that's the perfect story. And interestingly enough, it's a story that Putin 
um, parroted last fall in in one of these speeches that he, you know, one of the speeches that always gets watched, watched closely. So Putin is now parroting that same, what I believe to be a limited hangout, which which would say that this story is being coordinated at the very highest levels of government on both sides. And that if I'm right, and again, I'm this is just well-informed speculation, but I, as I said, there are other reasons I believe this that I can't share, but um, that my belief is that Kavaladze and Goldstone, because one of the other interesting things is Goldstone, um, when the Goosefer 2.0 stuff started coming out, he told somebody, and I forget who it was, he told somebody that it was very eerie that those documents were coming out after what he had seen go on in that meeting. And that should be consistent with what he told Robert Mueller. So that, that what he, documents were coming out that the Guccifer 2.0, um, which were the he first was, he was Goldstone was surprised by that in light of what happened at the meeting. Yeah, he said it was. And, and why would he be surprised? Well, it, it suggests that he may have believed that those emails were, in fact, what had been dealt. It, it suggests he may. I mean, I don't want to get too far of, ahead of where the public record is, but he seemed to recognize the release of stolen emails by somebody believed to be a Russian front, Guccifer 2.0, as something that had a relationship to the meeting he attended. Oh, and he was surprised because it was too early in the kind of quid pro quo scheme of things for it to be released or what? Uh, maybe he didn't believe it was really going to happen. I mean, his like I, like I said, you know, this guy seemed pretty afraid that the oligarchs were going to go after him. So, Of course, in any event, he... Remind me, he was not there for the most important part of the meeting, or I think he might have been. He might have um, been. He, he he's employed by Agalarov, like Kabbaladza. He's employed okay. by Agalarov. He's the one who has good ties. He's a, he's buddies with Don Jr. He's the one who set up mm -hmm. the meeting. So, so I don't know what he was there for, but if in fact there was a later half of the meeting, um, he probably was at least still present in Trump Tower. Whether or not he was in the room, I don't know. Okay, so anyway, your strong suspicion is that. It wasn't merely the relatively innocent version of the quid pro quo that doesn't involve uh, law breaking because it doesn't involve stolen emails. You think there was a, a more nefarious quid pro quo um, that involved the, the emails. And some of the reasons you think that you can talk about, some you can't. I'm curious, can you say anything about the nature of the evidence you can't talk about? In other words, are you doing kind of uh, investigative reporting and talking to people and you know stuff that's not in the public record or what? Uh, yeah, I'll say sure. Okay. <laughs> I'm, yeah, I'm not going to go into You'll it. say but... that and we'll hope that's not just a limited hangout. Uh, okay, yeah, no, so, um, yeah. so, uh, so what are the, so why don't you summarize again? You've talked about some of the reasons you think that there was an explicit deal at this meeting. We've got illegally obtained emails. We want sanctions relief. By the way, we should say there are other things the Russians wanted, but, but besides sanctions relief, there was an interesting thing with the Republican platform okay. where the Republican campaign, uh, the Trump campaign insisted against some resistance on keeping the Ukraine part of the platform pretty Russia friendly. I don't think we need to go further than that, but that much is accurate, right? Yeah, I don't think that's the strongest evidence of the quid pro quo, but it is something pointed to. I think that that is, um, it's clearly something that the highest levels of the Trump campaign were shepherding, but I think um, some of, some other events are far more interesting. For example, Don Jr. went to Paris, uh, was hosted by these, I hope I get this right, pro-Russian Syrians. Um, we, even Jared Kushner's public testimony, which I suspect Mueller believes was not entirely true. Even his public testimony makes it clear that, A, the morning after the election, Vladimir Putin uh, sent a congratulatory email and he immediately turned to try and reach out to Sergei Kislyak. And he described reaching out to Sergei Kislyak as being about um, working on Syria, which is why I think that Syria is also one of those, one of those policy items in, in the mix here. So... Um, sanctions. And then and then we know this is what uh, Mike Flynn was pled guilty for. Um, we know that Mike Flynn spent December 29th on the on the phone with Sergei Kislyak, the ambassador, Russia's amb then ambassador to the United States, 
basically arranging, uh, basically getting Russia to hold off on on responding badly to Obama's new sanctions for for hacking the election. Um, and he succeeded in doing that. One more interesting aspect of that is he was he was on the phone with uh, Katie, Katie McFarland, who is now up for up to be ambassador of Singapore. Um, but she was at Mar-a-Lago. And those emails where she was directing Flynn what to say and what to do were not turned over to investigators at first. And it was suggested that they might claim privilege over those emails. Now, Trump wasn't present yet, so he could not claim privilege over them in any case. But if they were thinking they were going to claim privilege over Katie McFarland directing Flynn to um, get the Russians to hold off on any response to the sanctions, then what they're saying is Katie McFarland was sitting in Mar-a-Lago with Trump, Mm -hmm. relaying Trump's instructions to Mike Flynn about the sanctions. And then we've got the quid pro quo delivery again, right to the top of the administration. Okay. Um, So what are some other reasons that you can talk about, if there are some, that that make you uh, think that this was a quid pro quo of the illegal kind. I mean, we should also say that I think the other difference between quid pro quo and collusion just as a political matter is I would think quid pro quo is a whole lot more damaging. I mean, you know, it's like yeah. if you are if you are really uh, altering American policy uh, to pay back somebody who helped you, uh, especially a foreign actor who helped you, you, you do this, especially via stolen emails. But if you're actually altering American policy in a, in a covert deal with a foreign power, I would think even in the current political context where the two tribes, pro-Trump and anti-tribe, seem pretty well solidified, I would think that would still be pretty damaging, right? It is, but let me say two caveats. That's why I'm the one who's not hysterical, right? Right. Um, one... Remember that the bribery law has been virtually gutted by SCOTUS in recent years. Um, And in fact, one of the members of Trump's team, I mean, sorry, of Mueller's team has had cases overturned in New York Hmm. where, you know, he busted uh, corrupt Republicans in New York. And the case, uh, Sheldon Silver, is he Republican or Democrat? I think he's Democrat. But regardless, he had bribery in the wake of the bribery case against the governor of Virginia, um, McDonald. Uh, his case was overturned by a Supreme Court. And I think that that precedent has made it very difficult to hold public figures accountable for bribery. So that, I think, is one of the reasons that Mueller has these really good uh, appellate lawyers on his team, because he needs to understand how to reinvent the law of bribery in this country. Mm-hmm. He's already succeeded, by the way, in uh, in reinventing the Foreign Registration Act, which is a good start. Well, but, I hadn't even uh, thought of bribery being a term here, but 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 in principle, it could if Trump altered policy in exchange for something of value in any sense. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, there's still the ca- illegal campaign finance finance, uh, and I think that you know conspiracy to uh, to hack is another possible charge on the table. But but bribery is going to be a lot more difficult. And the other thing that that it pays to keep in mind. And that is true, is that Trump never hid his pro-Russian policy. He was always upfront about it. So it's not like he was clandestine. Right. And and the other thing about that, and by the way, let me clarify, I was I was just talking in political terms when I said the the sense in which quid pro quo is worse than collusion. I would just think it would be more politically damaging, not necessarily Mm -hmm. legally. But but um, the other thing that's complicated that that you mentioned is it's not just that he was upfront about his Russia policy. It arguably fit into a larger ideology of kind of realism in for, yeah. in the is a foreign uh, you know the for is the relevant foreign policy term that uh was kind of part of bannonism in, in other words hey we don't worry about human rights in other countries we don't worry about dealing with bad guys we just do deals with the leaders who are the leaders of the countries and so on it broadly fits into that. On the other hand, you could ask, well, why didn't it play out that way with China? He was very anti-China. And also, of course, now on Iran, suddenly Trump is deeply concerned about human rights. So ultimately, 
any kind of coherent realist foreign policy ideology falls apart. On the other hand, as of the campaign, uh, you know, it, it could you could argue you you could say that this isn't it, this isn't a real shocker that Trump would speak about Russia this way, right? There, yeah. There's another thing to throw in the mix too, though. Um, I, I like to always point to what I call Jared's peace plan. Um, so Jared Kushner very early on got put in charge of, of Trump's like grand deal, not just on Israel, uh, Israeli Palestinian quote unquote peace, right? But also this grand deal in the Middle East altogether. This 30 some year old who can't even fill out a form by himself is going to radically alter the, sh the, the shape of the Middle East. And in that context, it's not just about Russia. And that's something we should maintain throughout, which is that. Kushner was making deals with people, with the Israelis, the Saudis, the Emirates, in addition to the Russians, at a time when people from those countries, and you can throw China in there, actually, at a time when people from those countries were bailing out his family business. Mm -hmm. And this is, a, this is a pattern that we see with Manafort, when we see with Kushner, and we see going back years with Trump, which is that these people have control over American foreign policy, can influence Kushner in part because Kushner's family empire is badly in debt and needs infusions of cash, which are only going to come from crazy people overseas at this point, because it's clear he's he's underwater and not going to get out of it. Um, and therefore, there is credible reason to believe that that he is that this grand Jared peace plan, which he has no competence to craft in any case, is the Israelis and the Saudis and the Emirates and the Russians dictating policies to him in exchange for them bailing out his family. Do you th is that the kind of thing that M that Mueller could bring as a case? Yeah. And again, we go back to whether bribery is is bribery anymore. That's why we go to money laundering. Right. Uh, there are some Deutsche Bank investments in Kushner that came right after or right before the election, those are going to be key because mm -hmm. those would reflect whether uh, he was. And again, all these people are real estate moguls. And so all of these people can launder money by buying property at uh, inflated rates and selling it for less and keep pop pocketing the diff difference. Right. Or or Manafort, who laundered a million dollars, I think, of of. Um, of antique rugs. So, uh, so you know, all of these figures are, are money launderers in good stead. And so you're much more likely to get them for money laundering. And frankly, a big chunk of Mueller's team has expertise in money laundering. So that seems to be where they were going from day one. Yeah, although, the way, po that, although that, politically, it's a much bigger deal for uh, Jared to be selling out American foreign policy so that we can he can escape from these various stupid real estate deals his family did. Right, right. Um, now, I mean, that's, um, a, that's a huge thing, I would think, politically. Almost, you know, in a, almost bigger than, than Trump, uh, you know, uh, helping, helping, you know, knowing about illegal emails and, and helping the Russians deploy them uh, in exchange for... I mean, both of those, I would think, are big, big, foreign po big, big political deals if indeed American foreign policy was part of the deal, was part of what we altered uh, for these other, uh, these foreign players. I would think either of those are big deals. But the the the, the Kushner thing is almost worse because it does just sound like flat out bribery, whatever the legal standing of it, right? Right. And, and what's interesting is um, Trump has, has said that investigating his business deals would be a red line where he might fire Mueller. The, both of the the non-credible House Intelligence Committee investigation, but even the credible Senate Intelligence Committee investigation, both of those have basically scoped so as to avoid any financial dealings. And Ron Wyden, for example, has been screaming for months about the fact that the Senate Intelligence Committee is not looking at these, these this, the evidence that there was this, you know, the, this money laundering, that it's behind it all. And so when I described earlier that I believe Nunes, his job is to give Trump a clean bill of health in a few weeks, uh, part of that is an effort to forestall any investigation into these financial dealings. So uh, Bannon today 
as we're as we're talking, is sitting there at Hipsy saying that the the best evidence against Trump is on these financial dealings. And Nunes's job is to make sure that none of the congressional investigations ever look at it and having not looked at it, give Trump a clean bill of health. And then that um, that Mueller has a much more difficult time getting the space to conduct the investigation of the financial dealings. So that's sort of where I think we're at today. And, and Nunes is the, the head of the committee that that you think is doing the whitewash, the, the congressional committee. Yeah, and I would say not just not not just whitewash. I would say I, I accused him of being a mole the other day because he, in the guise of needing to see whether the FBI is in the bag for Hillary Clinton, which is again farcical, he has, I think, demanded that the FBI turn over or share, not turn over, share with uh, his investigators all of the what are called F, uh, FBI 302 forms, which are the reports of interviews with witnesses. So in other words, what he has done is established everything that has happened outside of the grand jury, all of the evidence that exists against Trump uh, in the FBI's possession right now. And therefore, I assume that Trump also knows what's what's included in that. Okay. So so to kind of review, you think that uh, there is evidence, uh, some of which we haven't seen, uh, for that, that there was a an actual quid pro quo that the deal apparently was done at the meeting at Trump Tower, and that it involved uh, not just like uh, what what the Russians were bringing to the table was not just kind of some kind of vague oppo research, but actually illegally obtained emails, which I yes. gather as a legal matter means that there could be a conspiracy charge. Is that right? Yep. And and so you believe this both for uh, because of evidence that's on the public record and for because of evidence that you uh, can't talk about yet. And so I guess I have two questions in closing. One is, uh, is there any major evidence on the public record uh, that's in this category that we haven't talked about yet? No, but I will say uh, interesting development happened in November that um, Mueller's the the original scope of the Mueller investigation had bracketed off the cybersecurity side of it. Um, that was being handled by, as I understand it, prosecutors in in Pittsburgh who are experts on kind of state hacking and and some people in in uh, in San Francisco. And in November, Mueller uh, added a very technically adept cybersecurity prosecutor to his team. And so that is taken as a scene that as a sign that whereas up until that point, there wasn't this focus on the crime of stealing emails starting in November that may have been on the table in Mueller's in Mueller's uh, bag of evidence, I guess. OK. Uh, and then my final question is the evidence uh, that you can't talk about. Uh, I assume that's evidence that would be accessible to Mueller so far as you know. So, as far as I know, yeah. OK, so so that means that in your view, we can expect uh, something uh, not trivial to, to come out of all this. And, you know, it's funny. I was just listening to this uh, podcast, this Trumpcast podcast, when I think it was Jacob Weisberg who was talking to it's either Susan Hennessy or Suzanne Hennessy. She's part of the lawfare Susan, thing. Yeah, Susan. And, and she was kind of um, it's funny because lawfare, I don't pay that much attention to this stuff, but I had taken the drift of their stuff over the past year to be kind of dramatizing this and raising expectations all of a sudden as i understood it she was saying to jacob like uh i don't think there's going to be a big legal case to emerge from this well let me let me give a caveat uh, and i don't want anyone to expect anything this is this is why you play the game right i mean Mueller is is very competent his prosecutors are very competent trump has a lot of tools to play there are still uh, Article two games that Trump could play. He's got Nunes being his mole. There are a lot, you know, there's there's the politics of this. So I'm not promising anybody should expect this. And I'm not sure that the evidence rises to the level such that you could charge Don Jr. or charge Jared Kushner. And again, a lot of that de depends on whether Mueller can buy enough time to collect the financial evidence to make the case. So 
please don't expect anything based off what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. um, but I do think that the outlines are possible. Um, but I, but I also, um, one other caution that I would give is that Mike Flynn was just charged with, with, uh, lying to the FBI. Now they did, they did kind of undercharge that they made three charges, one charge. So as, uh, you know, so if he's, so he may avoid prison time altogether, um, for cooperating and people who know well, like Preet Bharara, who would love to see prison, who'd love to see Trump, you know, go to prison or something, has made it very clear that that may be an indication that that uh, Mueller doesn't have evidence that Flynn was was part of this wider quid pro quo. Now, um, and and so I think you should take you should take details like that as another caution that it is possible that one of the most important witnesses in this case, Mike Flynn. Um, isn't even involved in any conspiracy. And if he's not, then is there really a conspiracy there? And I think it's it's a fair question. Yeah, it's funny. There had initially been another interpretation of the Flynn deal, and I think this was initially promulgated on Lawfare, which was that, wow, if they're charging him with this much less than they could charge him with, he must be delivering something big. There were two different interpretations floating around, I think, but you you think the Preet Bahara uh, more kind of minimalizing interpretation makes sense? I don't know what to, I mean, I, I have so much a secret. I, I think it is possible that Flynn was not in on the front end of the quid, excuse me, of the quid pro quos. We know right. of several key meetings that he did not attend where somebody attending the meeting, including Jeff Sessions, by the way, might be aware of a quid pro quo. He wasn't there. Mm -hmm. So when he was implementing policy after the election, when he was, you know, uh, chiding the Russians into backing up of any kind of sanctions response. Did he know the front end of the deal? Did he know that there was a quid pro quo? Did he know that he was part of this conspiracy? I think it's possible he didn't and that he was just taking orders. It's clear he was just taking orders. So that's a third possibility that may be the case. We just don't know. And people should understand the evidence and not get too carried away, but also understand where the real evidence lies. And it's not with the dossier. Okay, I, I promise not to ask any more questions after this, but this just reminded me of the Jared Kushner thing. Um, for s obscure reasons, it reminded me of that. The, the one other thing about Jared Kushner is, as I recall, he had evidence that he actually excused himself from that Trump Tower meeting early, right? He, he, he supposedly emailed his secretary and said, call me so I can get out of this meeting or something. That, that, if I'm remembering correctly, that, why would you expect that if he has such reason to to be so deeply interested in this? Well, uh, it, did he leave the meeting to leave the meeting? Or did he leave the meeting to go talk to, to Pops and tell him what had happened in the meeting? Mm. Or tell him, you know, that this is... I don't know the answer to that, but I think it is... Um, and Bannon has said he thinks there was some uh, rivalry between Don Jr. and Kushner at the time. I I don't know. Um, mm. I don't I don't believe that Kushner is telling the truth. I'm positive that Kushner, who does, by the way, have a very competent lawyer, has um, arranged it thus. Kushner has appeared before Mueller's, he has been interviewed. At the time of the interview, he was asked questions according to reports. Um, he was asked, for example, whether he had any exonerating information about Flynn. Mm -hmm. um, he probably did. He probably had information to know that Flynn was being ordered to do all the things he did, but he clearly didn't give it to Mueller. And um, feeling like he was betrayed is reportedly one of the reasons that Flynn did flip. So that's one thing he was asked. But he was also asked about comments he had made. So he testified uh, to the Senate Intelligence Committee and he was asked. For example, I raised the fact that there was an email, a congratulatory email from Putin the, the day after the election, and K uh, Kushner immediately asked for, um, started to reach out to Kislyak, the, the ambassador. And he has explained that as him trying to figure out whether the congratulatory email from Putin was, was, um, was a hoax or real. I suspect it, that wasn't the case. I okay. suspect that, you know, he reached out to the ambassador to do what we know happened, which is uh, advancing discussion of things like Syria, uh, which he admitted, things like Syria. And so 
I suspect that Kushner lied in his testimony. I think Mueller knows that he lied and is sort of putting the pieces into place to take the next step on that. Now, if I'm charging the son-in-law of the president, I'm going to charge him with more than just lying. And I think Kushner probably is guilty of far more than just lying. But um, but I, you know, that's sort of where I think Kushner is. And, and again, Kushner is somebody who is financially in much more dire straits than than the Trumps. As as shoddy as their empire is, it doesn't have the six 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 park 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 fifth, place. Fifth, yeah. fifth Avenue, I think, yeah, right? Yeah, right. Six 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 Fifth Avenue, the uh, inauspiciously named building. Uh, <laughs> he couldn't, <laughs> he couldn't turned make it out up. to be a complete disaster for the Kushner family. Right. Yeah. Um, Okay, well, thanks so much, Marcy. And again, the places to find your stuff are Empty Wheel at EmptyWheel.net, the blog, or the Twitter feed, uh, Empty Wheel. Um, and uh, I, you got me on the edge of my seat. I, I, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm more optimistic than I had been that this could turn out to be very bad news for Donald Trump. Uh, well, we'll see. Like I said, that's why they play the game. That wait, we. You never can tell how these special investigations are going to go because the president always has a great deal, a great deal of tools at hand to kill investigations. But um, yeah, we'll see. Yeah. Uh, OK, well, thanks so much, Marcy. And, uh, and I hope you'll come back and talk, talk again when there have been uh, more developments. Great to be on. Thanks.